possibly out of Cleveland. You want to be a boss? That's how you be a boss. I did. I made a mistake. So I'm sitting here, and we're all just kind of minding our own business as we go through the college and professional football season. We're in the bowl season right now, and well, I'm in Florida, so it's kind of warm, and you can see that I'm red-faced because Urban Meyer and I whooped up on my brother and my nephew uh, yesterday. We beat him and beat him and beat him and beat him, and then, ladies and gentlemen, something happened in professional football that I'm not sure we ever thought was going to happen, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Jacksonville Jaguars. That's right. I'm saying it. Here's the deal. Now, whether you are a Colts fan, a Jets fan, a Broncos fan, a Seahawks fan, it really doesn't matter. Okay, but here's the deal. Um, Jacksonville, bad. Jets, Giants win a couple games. Good. That's how the world goes. I, I looked at the beginning of the season and my God, the Giants have won a couple games. Uh, Brian Dable has got to be the coach of the century. Oh, my God. Robert Sala's team won a game or two. Then Zach Wilson happened, and away they went. All the while, two teams have been just slowly coming. One is Jacksonville, and one is Detroit. And you saw it last night. I'm going to go through some numbers for you. You ready? Listen to this. 19-3 to was the win last night. That's a good number. 7-8 and eight for Jacksonville is like going undefeated for other teams. That's a good number. Jacksonville's won 4 of 5. That's a good number. But, it, but wait, there's more. Jacksonville is now one game or a half game, if you will, depending on what happens coming up. With the Titans and Houston, if Titans lose, guess what? Jacksonville tied for first. Titans win. Jacksonville's still a game out. And if everybody can take care of their business, guess what's going to happen? The last game of the year between the Titans and the Jacksonville Jaguars is going to be a deal. Think about that. All right, Trevor Lawrence. I've been all over Trevor Lawrence. I've been thinking he's good. I've been thinking he's garbage. I don't know what the hell to think, but here's the deal. Three games, they've won them all. 20 for 31, 229, uh, an 86.6 quarterback rating last night. Sloppy game. We all know it, but let's go backwards. Trevor Lawrence, 27 for 42, 318 yards, four touchdowns, an interception, and 109 rating against Dallas. Let's go back even farther, shall we? 30 of 42, 368 yards, three, count them, three touchdowns. No, count them, no interceptions. 121.8 passer rating. You tell me. So here's my big take of the day. The NFL's a long freaking season. The NFL's a long season, and I will also tell you, don't buy into the hype of everything New York. Honest to God. It's a long season. I heard nothing about Jacksonville. I heard nothing about Detroit. All I heard was New York this, New York that, Brian Dable this, Robert Sala that. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, it's why I say all the time, you got to let this stuff play out. Now, does that mean Jacksonville's in the playoff? Of course not. If I were betting, I would bet they would because here's some more information for you. Listen to this, Colts fans, and this will really make you sick. Um, the Colts are now eliminated from the playoffs. Six of eight years. It is the worst stretch. I will get to that. And while that's happening in the AFC South, let me tell you what also is happening. Titan, excuse me, Texans and the Titans is actually a big game. Texans, excuse me, and the Jaguars is actually a big game. Think about that for a second. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. It's a big game. And then the biggest game of them all might be Jacksonville playing the Titans last game of the year at home. While we sit here and, again, media creation, the Indianapolis Colts, I just mentioned to you, six of the last eight years, the Colts have not made the playoffs. When you went into this year, many people, once again, felt like, well, you know, the Colts and the Titans are the two teams, and they might be. 
But let me give you some. The cold stinks, and it's about 10 degrees below zero. And in Indianapolis, as I get on Twitter here, I see the wrecks. I see the snow, the ice, the sleet. And I'm in Florida, so my toes are tapping. I don't know about your toes, but my toes are tapping. Get out of Indy. It's a bad football town. We got a murder rate, and it's cold as hell. It is. It's minus one in Nash Vegas, baby. Minus one. All right? couple of other things. Yesterday, $100 billion is what we ultimately are sending to the Ukraine. Thomas Massey's uh, congressman said, let's put it this way. That's more than $200 million this year from each congressional district. What could your congressman have done with your district or for your district for $200 million? How about that? Put that in your pipe and smoke it. So we got that going on. We got bad football in Indy. We got Jacksonville has good football somehow, some way. And the Houston Texans, who haven't won a game since I was in 12th grade, are apparently going to play big games down the stretch. It's a Christmas miracle. It's Festivus, ladies and gentlemen. Did you know today is Festivus? Festivus for the rest of us. That's what we're getting. Speaking of holiday spirit, there's a grumpy old sportscaster slash weatherman hanging out in Iowa, Waterloo to be specific. Let's hear from this very unhappy reporter. Mark, how are you feeling out there? Uh, again, uh, the same way I felt about eight minutes ago when you asked me that same question, right? I normally do sports. Uh, everything is canceled here for the next couple of days. So what better time to ask the sports guy to come in about five hours normally uh, earlier than he would normally wake up, go stand out in the wind and the snow and the cold and tell other people not to do the same. I didn't even realize that there was a 3.30 also in the morning uh, until today. It's absolutely uh, fantastic, Ryan. You know, I I'm used to these evening shows that are only 30 minutes long and generally on those shows I'm inside. So uh, this is a really long show. Tune in for the next couple hours to watch me progressively get crankier and crankier. How do I get that uh, Storm Chaser 7 duty? I, I feel like Clint got the uh, better end of that deal. You know, that thing's heated. Um, the outdoors currently is not heated. Well, I'll tell you what, Ryan, I've, I've got good news and, and I've got bad news. The, the good news is that I can still feel my face right now. The bad news is I kind of wish I couldn't. Can I go back to my regular job. I, I'm pretty sure, Ryan, that you guys added an extra hour to this show just because somebody likes torturing me because compared to two and a half hours ago, it is just getting colder and colder. Live in Waterloo for the last time this morning, thankfully, I'm Mark Woodley, New 7 KWWL. Mark Woodley was not happy. See, that's how weathermen should be. Seriously. That guy is giving you a dose of what should happen with Storm Tracker 6 or whoever, Jim Cantori. You think Jim Cantori really wants to be out there? He might really want to be out there. But you got to admire a guy that's going to be out in the cold, in the snow, who's telling you, look, I'm telling all you people not to do what I'm doing. See, I, I, the guy will probably be fired, right? The guy will probably have a problem. The guy is somebody, but we're playing it. I mean, it's going to go, it's already viral. The dude's going to get billions of views. Somebody somewhere is going to understand what water weather is like better than if some, you know, young person right out of meteorology school or right out of Indiana just said, hey, look, it's cold and rainy outside. This dude gave you what's real. He's bundled up. He's a sports guy, so he's used to saying, well, the Iowa Hawkeyes fell to the Ohio State Buckeyes 17-3 to as Kirk Ferentz's crew couldn't get it going offensively, and C.J. Stroud came out on fire and then settled in for a nice victory for the Ohio State Buckeyes. That's what he's used to doing. He's not used to going, hey, don't do what I'm doing. It's cold out here. It's for reason. Don't do it. See, that to me is what Americana 
is all about. And you'll see a picture of me at some point in this broadcast where I know of what I speak because I, too, was weather guy at ESPN standing outside during the basketball marathon that we had there and giving a weather report on a blizzard that was coming in, except I was dumber. I had the whole backpack on, and I went in the snow, and I made snow angels, and I think about, oh, I don't know, half of the, what, the electronic staff was about ready to crap because, well, I had about $10,000 of gear on me, which I didn't know was $10,000. I was just making snow angels, and they said I was lucky I didn't get electrocuted. So there you go. Mark Woodley, you freaking stud you. But man, oh man, oh man, uh, be careful out there. The weather is horrific. It's not horrific here, although there was a storm last night. And it is dangerous. I hate to give you a weather report from sunny Florida, but I got to tell you, I'm giving you a weather report from sunny Florida. Speaking of a report, you all know that Franco Harris passed away. It was inter- It gets more interesting. People are showing, hey, look, I just talked to Franco yesterday. Chris Russo had the opportunity to interview Franco Harris right before he passed away. Franco Harris and Rocky Blyer are as famous as running back duo as you're ever going to hear about. I mean, it was Jim Kick, Mercury Morris, and Larry Zonk. That was who ran for the Miami Dolphins undefeated crew. In Pittsburgh, it was Rocky Blyer, out of the Army, served from 1968 to 1970. Listen to this. Got a Purple Heart, all caught injured in battle, came back from war and played in the NFL. And not only played, Rocky Blyer won four Super Bowls. That's right, four of them. He was there with Bradshaw and Franco Harris and Lynn Swan and John Stallworth and all the great linemen. Uh, Joe Green and Dwight White, L.C. Greenwood, and the whole crew. But a lot of people don't know the dude won the Brown Star. Dude won the Purple Heart. And there was a day where Rocky Blyer and Franco Harris were the most prolific set, was the most prolific set of running backs in the NFL. Now, Rocky Blyer is going to join us coming up here in a couple of minutes. And it's going to be fascinating to me because Rocky Blyer and Franco Harris were basically a tandem, a tandem that didn't get near the credit, maybe particularly Blyer, that the wide receiver, Lynn Swan, and Lynn Swan should have. He made unbelievable catches in the biggest moments, certainly the quarterback. But Rocky Blyer is going to join us coming up here in a minute. Our guy Guns is going to join us uh, coming up here in, oh, I don't know, an hour or so. The Bear, you know Chris Felica, from ESPN and NNN, did you know that the Bear is now with Fox or will be as soon as the college football playoff is over? So Bear is ours, baby, and we're going to get into uh, some bets with the Bear, and you're going to like it because he's one of the nicest all-time guys. I've got four or five bets for you. I I don't want to say his name wrong, so I'm going to ask you guys, Dylan, and all of that. Jake Bacchetti is going to join us. Now, Jake is an Arkansas Razorback. He's won Super Bowls uh, with the New England Patriots, and he is an Army Ranger. He's going to join us. We're going to talk about a number of things. One of the things we're going to talk about is what's going on with the Patriots. What would it be like for Jacoby Myers after the backward pass? Another thing we're going to talk about is can you believe this? Can you believe our armed forces is getting rid of yes, ma'am, yes, sir? I mean, what, 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 is, what are we doing here? I don't really understand what we're doing in our country, but maybe it's not for me to understand. Maybe it's just for me to go along. But as you all know, I can't just go along. I don't understand $100 million in aid to the Ukraine when we don't discuss our borders. The president yesterday turned and walked away when he was asked about the open borders in the southern part of our country. He just simply turned and walked away. We'll get into it and we'll ask Jake uh, about what is the obligation of a president, of an administration to answer questions. I don't think you have to answer all of the questions. I don't think that you are obligated to prove yourself on every issue every time you speak. It's what you have a press secretary for. 
they handle the day to day. But when there is a seeming catastrophe, a catastrophe, and all you got to do, and maybe the videos lie, but they always say the eye in the sky don't lie. When you look at a, a picture from anything down in El Paso, you know what you see? You see a wide open border. That's what you see. So in seeing a wide open border, Americans, foreign Americans, well, Americans that came in and did it the right way, go, wait a second. This is not right. And when Americans, and it's not just the news organization, it's all of Americans like this is not right. You should, at least in my opinion, as the leader of our country that seems to be giving away our money like it's his job, um, man, at some point, you got to say, all right, this is what I'm doing with the border. This is how we're doing it. This is what's going to happen. And away we go. That That's just, it, that to me is just common sense. And if it isn't common sense to you, then, hey, look, we just have a difference of opinion. But were I to be the president, I would answer a question. Yes, uh-huh, the border is not open. Here's what it truly is, blah, 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 instead of turning and walking away. We're waiting on Rocky Blyer. That doesn't mean I can't give you headlines from yesterday. I'll give you some. Let's go back on the farm, shall we? Can we go back on the farm? You know where the farm is? Stanford. They call it on the farm because that's what it is. It's a school on a farm. They call it the farm. Let's go through what Stanford is doing. Okay. Stanford is putting out handbooks that to prohibit harmful language like the word American. It's harmful because, according to Stanford, it insinuates that America us, United States of America, is better than the rest of the Americas, Central and South. That's harmful, according to Stanford. They feel that to be bad. Okay. Uh, grandfather. Grandfather is racist to black voters. Walk-in is ableist. White paper is racist. Hey, I, let me ask you, what would we call this? I don't know. Looks like a white piece of paper to me. But hell, I'm dumb. This ain't a white piece of paper. Uh, this is a color neutral piece. I don't know. But I got to tell you, it's insanity. It's complete insanity. White paper, ableist. All right. Okay. America puts us on a pedestal. We should be on a pedestal. About time we got on a pedestal. Grandfather, racist to black voters. All right. Okay. Um, let me let me ask you a question. Do you think you would send your kid to Stanford? Like if you were paying for it and you made the decision. And your kid is like, you know, there's a couple of things that I, places I would like to go, um, okay? Stanford also says, you guys, company that I worked for, Radio One, said you guys was bad. You're supposed to say folks. Yeah. You're supposed to say folks. Uh, and it does it here, too. You guys showed up in a list of gender-based, because that's so offensive to have any reference to anything. Uh, they suggest folks or people, or everyone. The issue, you guys, is that it lumps a group of people using masculine language and or into gender binary groups, which don't include everyone. All right. U.S. citizen is preferred. Okay. Other terms, Karen, white paper, straight, submit. Abusive relationship, prisoner, crazy, victim, walk-in, and grandfather. Okay. I don't know what to tell you. I was born in America. I live in America. I'm an American. 
Uh, can we say beating a dead horse? I don't know. Deion Sanders. I love Deion Sanders. Deion Sanders is allowed to be old school because it just works. Deion Sanders can say and do things that others can't because, frankly, it just works. I don't think it has anything to do with being a black coach, a white coach. I don't think – you know what I think? I think for Deion Sanders, his intellect just works. The common sense, the matter of fact. So Deion Sanders, uh, there's a guy named Bamani Jones. Bamani Jones is, in order, the worst radio host in the history. You can look it up of ESPN, the worst blogger in the history of ESPN, had the lowest rated television show in the history of ESPN, and somehow just got an extension from, guess what, ESPN. Bomani Jones said that Deion Sanders sold a dream to Jackson State kids and then walked out on that dream. Deion Sanders said this, what did I sell? He was telling Shannon Sharp. Sharp said, well, Deion Sanders never said how long he was going to be. Well, what was the dream? The dream is that I wanted equality. The dream is that I wanted these kids to get the notoriety and get to the NFL. We did that. The dream is that we wanted better facilities and were overlooked and underfunded. And I obviously established that. The dream is that I believe, I believe that we could win. I believe that we could graduate at a certain rate. I believe we could treat these kids and raise them to be young men. That was the dream. Why did you stop dreaming, Bomani? I ain't. The dream continues. It's a good answer. It's a really good answer. If you're going to come at Deion Sanders, the one thing that I would say is you better come at him with some smart stuff. Because Dion, not only the way he says it, the passion with which he goes about it, but the words he uses is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. You may not like him. Hey, if you go to Colorado State or you go to Kansas or you go to Utah, you're not going to like him. You shouldn't like him. Why would you like him? Well, I like the coach at Purdue, but I didn't like him when I was coaching at Indiana. I like him now. So, yeah, but if you're going to come at Deion Sanders and you're going to come with nonsense, you're going to come weak. You better be ready for a rebuttal. And I like it. And the other, if Bomani Jones says it, just disregard it. It comes from a place of stupid. And anytime something comes from a place of stupid, you know what? You just discard. And Bomani Jones has been discarded for years and years and years and years. But somehow, some way, he... He keeps getting money from ESPN. He might be the Al Sharpton of TV because Al Sharpton is always in trouble, but he keeps getting more money and more money and more money. It's unbelievable. Hmm. All right. I don't know about this guy. I don't know what this guy's deal is, but I kind of dig on it. Um. Patriots owner Robert Kraft invited a fan to this weekend's game. Jerry Edmond at his first game kept his composure while a crazy, obnoxious, aggressive Raider fan got in his face. It's really amazing. A crazy biggin who looks like the epitome of Karen. Look at her. She's explaining. And the man stood there, Jerry Edmond, and let this idiot lose her collective mind on him while John Matusak pulled her big fat mouth away from Jerry Edmond. And then this guy had to hug her because she's obviously completely and totally out of her mind. Now I'm guessing the young lady woke up and felt really stupid, but anyway, Robert Kraft invited Jerry Edmond who was at his first NFL game, to sit with him this weekend at Gillette Stadium. Now, looking at those seats, I guarantee you Jerry Edmond is going to have a hell of a lot better time this time than having to listen to some big fat mouth and other places, Karen. See, I think people should be shamed. I think people that do stuff like this, I don't think anything about them is off limits. Nothing. 
about this woman is off limits. Her looks, her mouth, uh, her, her needing a hug. I don't. I, I think that when you are this idiotic and you have this much importance or this much alcohol or this much I don't food, I don't know, maybe she's on a sugar high, I think everything you do should be open for a guy like me to ridicule. I mean, look at this. Look at this crazy person. I mean to tell you, I, can you imagine going home to that? And I say that. That's not a human being. That's a farm animal treating another person as poorly as you can. And the other person saying, you know what? That's pretty good. You're an idiot. I ain't moving. I ain't letting you get to me. Go away. That was pretty freaking good. And I applaud. I do. I applaud uh, Robert Kraft for getting Jerry into his suite. Get him away from idiots and enjoy a game. Man, why is it that every single time I turn on Twitter after an NFL weekend, we've got idiots that are getting in other people's faces or idiots throwing hands? Explain it to me, Spanky. Explain it to me. Uh, we come back. It's our boy, Chris Felica, the bear. The bear and I are going to win us all some money. I don't know what happened to Rocky Blyer, but we'll get it figured out. Uh, Jake Baquette, B-E-Q-U-E-T-T-E-91. Give him a follow. Give him a look. You're going to love this, man. You're going to love this. This is a great, great show that we have right here, right now. I'm going to the YouTube chat to see what is going on. Ladies and gentlemen, it is unbelievable, but the Houston Texans are important at the end of the football season. We say that again. They haven't won a game since I was in eighth grade, but they are going to determine whether the Titans or whether the Jaguars go to the playoffs. They are. The world is upside down. The world is insane. And oh, by the way, last thing on last night and the Jaguars, uh, MetLife, they booed Zach Wilson. You know what? I was thinking about this. Zach Wilson and Josh Rosen. Remember Josh Rosen? Zach Wilson. I think the career is done. I do. I think the career is done. Uh, Rocky Blyer, 945. The Bear, next. Stay right here. We've got a great half hour for you. Let's win some money, and then let's talk to an absolute legend, uh, Bronze Star, Purple Heart winning, great, great, great NFL running back. We'll be right back. Welcome into the holiday edition of the Trey Wallace podcast. Happy to be joined today by SEC Mike. You guys know who he is. Michael Bratton joins us on the show. Mike, what's up, buddy? How are you? Hey, Trey. Um, it's always a treat having you on my show, that SEC podcast. So, hey, it's an honor to do your show. Well, listen, I, I appreciate you coming on. And it's the holiday season. We've got bowl games going on. We it's just a we got the transfer portal going on, signing day stuff going on. It's just it's chaotic. It's never a day off uh in, in college football, as you know. So that so let's start, let's start in the transfer portal, Michael, where we have seen, I think I saw a number that there are around fifteen hundred players in the transfer portal uh as we are having this conversation right now. And I would love to know your thoughts on how you think this has played out since the first day it opened and then realizing we have got until January 19th, if I'm not mistaken, until this thing closes. What, what's your early thoughts on how this has played out? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's nothing short of amazing, to be honest with you, Trey. Uh, I keep track of uh, all the players from the SEC that have jumped into the portal and A&M's got over 20, Arkansas, Auburn, Florida, Alabama. They're close to those figures as well, just below A&M. But, man, it's it's absolutely chaotic. And I still – I don't know if it's a good for the sport. I don't know if it's bad for the sport. But I certainly think that uh, teams like LSU and Ole Miss, I think they've kind of laid a blueprint. If you want to turn over your roster in a single offseason, it can be done. And I bet you Billy Napier – 
course, they're kind of doing it now, but I bet Billy Napier kind of wishes he would have taken that tactic as well. My man, my favorite, Chris Felique, a.k.a. the bear coming over to Fox is magic, baby. But last night, my friend, 3.30 in the morning, you got home from the excitement in NYC, huh? What happened? What'd you see? <laughs> what, did, what did I see? I saw a really bad quarterback situation on one side of the field with the, with the team that had a defense that was trying to keep their team in the game, at least as the perspective of a Jets fan. I got... It's funny, I, I was going back and forth with some friends, and I said to Kirk during the game uh, last night, like, like, it's almost unfair to have Zach Wilson to, to him out there right now because it's so obvious that the game is moving way too fast. He's got no confidence, and he probably he just doesn't look like he could play. So like, I, I don't think this is salvageable here. I, I mean, I'd be surprised if he played the rest of the year. Uh, as, as long as White is healthy, but on on the flip side, you've got a Jackson. But it, it's so ironic, by the way. Yeah, just you think back to 2020 and everything that went on. Like the only reason Trevor Lawrence is not a member of the Jets, and obviously he went there last night and won, was because of a late season game where the Browns went to play the Jets, and essentially everybody got COVID and tested positive and couldn't play, and their their practice and plays were like a. a a makeshift offense and an offensive line and a quarterback at a ballroom because they had no available players and uh, the Jets wind up pulling the upset and that's why the Jets put second and Jacksonville took first. But no, it, moving forward for Jacksonville, I mean, that was a team that looks pretty pretty confident right now. They're all kind of on the same page and he's got those receivers and for that defense to step up last night and play well again. But uh, <clears throat> I think people are more interested from the perspective of the Jets and what do they do now? So, uh, and not, not, not a good situation at the quarterback position, that's for sure. How do you miss so bad on Zach Wilson? I, 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 you know, he was a guy, I'm almost starting to think, I don't want to hear about guys that are moving up the draft charts. You, you, like no. Baker Mayfield moves up, Trubisky moves up, Zach Wilson moves up there. Based on what? Uh, uh, throwing, right. throwing from, throwing. 50 yards in the air on your knees at your pro day. Wow, look at that awesome throw. I I had a lot of hesitancy about Zach Wilson before the draft. It was funny. I, I, uh, I found a, a, a link last night. I was sitting there <laughs> at halftime and going through uh, some old tweets and stuff. And 
trust and stuff that I had pre and, and, and uh, Joe Ostrowski had written a column from an interview that I had done about me having concerns. And it was, it was there for people to see. It was as obvious as day that you had a guy who in 2019, I think he had he touched nine, nine touchdowns and eight interceptions or something like that. And then in 2020, when everything hit the fan and the season play, it was decided we're going to play, we're going to play and schedules were getting made up on the fly. You, you look at the situation that BYU was in, they had a horrible conference against a, a bunch of group of five teams that weren't like, are we going to play? Are we not going to play that, that game against Coastal Carolina that was scheduled like three days beforehand? He was, had an offensive line that had a, like a bunch of 24 and 25 year olds. And he had this like breakthrough season, this great year again, against a really bad uh, schedule and a perfect situation where BYU had a lot of a bunch of older players and, some of these other teams. And I was concerned that you had a, uh, a re- kind of a questionable sample size against the previous year where he emerged from nowhere and he's very slight and tiny. And I was concerned because, I mean, it, at the time too, it wasn't like the Jets had this talent laden roster around him like they actually do now. I mean, they were a playoff team with the exception of him. But again, you, 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 you talk yourself into what you want to see. You see the throw on pro day. You see him running around out there, albeit against inferior competition. And you want to think because you need a quarterback that he's the guy or whoever. And people are going to be doing that this year again with Will Levis. So, look, he's going to be, you're going to hear Will Will Levis as Josh Allen for the next five months. So, look, I want all these guys to succeed. I hope they succeed. But, but, but a lot of times teams are just so, desperate need of a quarterback that they over now I know I'm rambling here but look look at what the 49ers have done we had the 49ers and the Seahawks last week on Thursday Night Football and put up an unbelievable graphic it just showed all of their first and second round picks over the last x years and you know what they were they were all defensive linemen and front seven players like if that's not and I think the 49ers are pretty good like it, go, it just goes to show that they had all of these great picks. They worried about filling out the quarterback position later, which, oh, by the way, the one time they did reach for a quarterback was Trey Lance, and he's probably the third best quarterback on the roster right now. So I, 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 I would not take any of these quarterbacks high. I, I would wait and take a guy like Jake Hayner in the late second, early third round. Let me, let me go from a betting perspective. Are we believers in Detroit? Are we now believers in the Jaguars? Jaguar, And then you got Houston, who's playing well, but they got to play both the Texans. Uh, excuse me. They got to play the Titans and the Jags. So they influence this. Do we believe Detroit? Do we believe Jacksonville from a betting perspective? I, I do. I do believe more Jacksonville than I do Detroit. Uh, Jacksonville's got some better wings. I, I think they have more talent on the roster, certainly on the offensive side of the ball. Like the Lions were there to be to be had last week by the Jets. That was a complete meltdown by the Jets in the final two and a half minutes of that game last week. Uh, the Jets should have won that game. The Lions are still gotten away with a couple of games, and I still think that their defense at times uh, is very vulnerable to, to some big plays. But I do believe in the Jaguars. The Jaguars are favorites to win that division now. Uh, based on the, on the line. And it, it's funny, like the Lions, I think, are in a tricky spot this week uh, against Carolina, a team that fired their coach, by the way, and looked like and, and traded some guys and looked like they were headed uh, headed towards a tanky type season. And here they are one game behind the Buccaneers in that terrible division. But I, I, that, that's a tricky game, I think, on Sunday uh, for Detroit. So of uh, those two things, I think uh, – I think the Jaguars are uh, less Fugazi than the uh, than the Lions are. Yeah, if you were had a vote, maybe you do have a vote for Coach of the Year in the NFL. Is Sirianni the guy? Is Campbell the guy? Is now Peterson the guy? I mean, it's a pretty good <laughs> jobs coaching jobs been done around here. It, it is, and, and it's funny. I was talking with a with a bunch of buddies that I, uh, uh, Gil Alexander from Vison and some other guys on a text chain. Uh, about this as well, it, it, it's so hit or miss with how you perceive the award. Like right. the, if, if the Eagles go fifteen and two, you just kind of have to give it to Sirianni because he had that record. But he's got a bunch of talent. If I had a vote, which I don't, uh, 
I would vote Brian Dable. Like that is not a, a team full of a bunch of talent in, 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 that the Giants have. I mean, you got a quarterback in Daniel Jones that you aren't even sure if you're keeping moving forward. They're eight five and one, and they're going to make the playoffs with with not a whole lot going on. And, and and the fact that they've made that incredible improvement from last year, the improvement this year, like like I, 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 maybe I look at things too practically, and maybe that's my my fault and my downfall. Like, how is he eight five and one going to be in the playoffs? He's a 30 to one or 25 to one to win coach of the year. And then you got Dan Campbell with the Lions who are a more talented team and they're seven and seven and the Giants had the head to head win. I'm pretty sure. And the Lions may not make the playoffs. And Dan Campbell's like two to one. Like I just don't get how some of these odds are coming into play. So if I had a vote, I would actually vote Brian Dable who probably has no shot. Well, I also got to tell you, you mentioned Daniel Jones. That's another dude that all of a sudden started moving up the draft charts, right? All of a sudden, that dude, yep. you know, I, it, it, it is fascinating. And you mentioned Will Levis. I, I've watched enough. I, look, I, I don't know nothing, but I know that I'm not dra- I'm not selling my soul if I'm the Colts to find Will Levis at the top of a draft and make him my, my focal point. I'm not doing that with that guy. He seems like another, another guy. It, when, when he was at Penn State, again, this was earlier in his career, so he hadn't fully played and developed yet. But he was just viewed as kind of a, a guy who was going to come in and really couldn't throw when it was a change of pace and he was going to run and, and, and be hard to bring down and kind of be that, that change of pace, bolt of energy type guy to, to bring in. Um, but look, he, they had a terrible offensive line this year really bad offensive line. Uh, he played hurt for a good part of the year. Uh, they lost a lot of their weapons from last year as well. So he, he was kind of playing. He, he was kind of behind the eight ball to start this year. Uh, look, I, I love him. He's a great kid, and, and I love Mark Stoops. And I, I mean, it would be great for their program to see Will Levis go number one or number two overall in the draft. And I hope whoever takes him uh, does well there. Well, does well there. But I have, I have immense... And I have immense uh, concerns about taking any of these guys, whether it's Bryce Young, Will Levis, uh, C.J. Stroud, Anthony Richardson, as high as people are, are, are talking about them going. Um, Urban and I played golf yesterday. He told me, yeah. he told me Ohio State going to have to throw it about 50 times. Defensive backfield, uh, Georgia will give up yards. He mentioned a couple games. Um Give me your thoughts. Can Ohio State hang in here? Can TCU yeah. beat Michigan? I, I think Ohio State can hang in, and, and it's interesting. I, I'd love to know. I'd love to know Urban's thoughts on watching that Georgia defense. Uh, it, it appears to me, and with CJ Stroud, is an ability to run. It looked like some of the times that Georgia really struggles on defense is like Kirby gets like freaked out. It, it, it appears sometimes like when you have a running quarterback on the other side of the ball, and you go back to Alabama when he was there, like that was the the perceived kryptonite. And, and they have got a Georgia defense, which I, I think that there were concerns about Jaden Daniels in the in the uh, SEC championship game and some other quarterbacks that were on the move. I wonder if because C.J. Stroud is more of a, a statue, I guess, for the lack of a, a, a better analogy, and he's not as much of a, a running threat. If that's going to help the Georgia defense kind of bring some different pressures and bring some different looks uh, as well. But, but I do think Ohio State uh, has a shot to hang in there. And, 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 and shit, Urban knows better than anyone because he played uh, this role on this card up better than, than anyone out there. When, you, when, you, when you're Ohio State and you get uh, embarrassed in that fourth quarter at home against Michigan, uh, and we, six weeks ago we're talking about Oh, Ohio State and Georgia kind of be pal- being power rated one and one A, and maybe Ohio State might be a slight favorite on a neutral field if they were to play. And and now here we are because Ohio State had a terrible fourth quarter against Michigan and gave up some big plays, lost lost in the home field. Oh, they shouldn't be in the playoff. And, and, and Ryan Dan, those guys have been hearing about that for a month, and and now you have an up. And 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 that. And that <clears throat> And, 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 and now you've got an opportunity to, to, to go out there and do something about it. Uh, that, that's a very 
motivationally driving situations. I think Ohio State does have a uh, does, have, does have a shot. He felt like the interior of Georgia's defense is incredible. Uh, pass rush, not so much. Secondary, vulnerable. But he also said, "Look, I don't know if you can win throwing the ball fifty times in a game like that." You know, I mean, it. it I, I think it's going to be fascinating. And you're right about Ryan Day. I mean, we were. He and I were talking about the misery. He didn't have to go through it going 7-0 and against Ohio State. But, you know, it's like being the coach at Florida. He was saying about Napier, man, in that town, you can't leave your house without everybody swarming you and you you play mm-hmm. bad in a bowl game. You know, I mean, it, TCU, last thing before I let you go, TCU feels like one of those NCAA Cinderella's that just ain't going to get beat that's good enough, like Butler back in the day. Yeah, they're Cinderella, but they're also really, really good. Your vibe on uh, TCU, Michigan. That's a perfect analogy because they are – that. that's the team that they are. They're the guys – they're the team with not a lot of super high draft picks, not a lot of one-and-dones. Uh, they, they've got – Four senior starters and a junior starter who have been playing, what, 75, 80 games together, and, and they know everyone's position on the field and know their role and know where guys are going to be, and, and they gel and they come together, and you got a quarterback that you believe in, and Max Duggan, and uh, you, have it a bit, you, you know that when it gets down to the end of the game, you're going to make a play and win. I mean, that's exactly what they are. Uh, I think that they can hang in. Uh, I, I Look, they, they got a receiver by the name of Quentin Johnston who is a stud. I mean, they got guys on the outside who can make plays. And, and if you, if you want to kind of kind of nit, nit pick and throw and, and shoot holes and in Michigan, you can say, hey, Illinois, with that terrible offense, and, and they, we were in the game. Maryland hung around for a while. Uh, the Ohio State game was a, a, a game. They were trouble at halftime, and it was a game for three quarters. So, I think the one thing that would concern me, though, is what we saw uh, Deuce Vaughn and that Kent State front in, in that game, able to control the line of scrimmage and kind of run the ball uh, at will for large periods of the game. And that's what Michigan has done for most of the year. Uh, Michigan has kind of worn people down behind that offensive line, uh, wearing teams down a huge edge in the fourth quarter in terms of scoring differential. So that that's ultimately what I how I see this game playing out again. I, I think Michigan does have an edge. I got a feeling we're going to wind up seeing a rematch of the of the uh, the Orange Bowl from last year of Ohio, uh, Michigan and Georgia, and probably the same results because I think the same problems that Georgia presented Michigan last year, I think they're going to present to them again this year. So I, I know it's not sexy. I know it's not pretty. I know it's not being bold, but I'm just boring. I'm this boring old bear. I'm going to pick Georgia to repeat. Appreciate you, boring old bear. I got you never <laughs> boring old bear. So thank you, my friend. That's good stuff. Appreciate it, bud. We'll talk again soon. Yes, sir. That is Chris Malika now with Fox, baby. He's going to go through the national championship with ESPN. Look, I, I agree. I think that Georgia is the team to beat. But I also think this. I think, yeah, we remember Ohio State getting their brains beat out. Of course we do. They did. And if that game would have gone 10 minutes longer, I think Michigan would have scored two more touchdowns on long drives. Maybe it exposed Ohio State. Maybe, just maybe, and this does happen in the world of sports, maybe it helped Ohio State. Maybe it enhanced Ohio State. Maybe it humbled Ohio State. And you know what you're going to do? I think in this game, you're going to know fairly early whether this is going to be a ball game or not. I think you're going to know if Ohio State can throw the football. Again, I'm just going by spending uh, basically all day yesterday with Urban Meyer talking about this and talking about the game and talking about different things. But if Ohio State can throw the football and they can throw it down the field, like I'm not talking about trying to outrace them. I'm not talking about trying to throw it, you know, five, three, seven. I'm talking about throwing the football. I'm talking about some big plays. I'm talking about getting it down the field. I'm talking about uh, not having to go 80 yards in 14 plays. That's what I'm talking about. Then I think you're going to see a ball game. But if they can't drop back, if they can't throw the ball, if they can't get the ball out of the hands of C.J. Stroud, then you got a problem. Uh, The Henderson kid, he's not playing. Fast guy doesn't really break tackles. Is that a big loss? Yeah, I'm sure it's a big loss. Kids seem like he was pretty good, could make some plays. But the truth of the matter is, 
uh, Ohio State's played without the sophomore for a lot of the year, and they should be ready to rock and roll. In the other one, I got to tell you, I do feel this message like, system four one two five like two, it's three, Butler, eight, right? Zero, I'm, two, I'm sitting zero. there going, all available. right, Butler basketball at the, at the time. Please record your message. People don't when have you uh, recording, people don't you have hang a sense up, or press this. one for more uh, options. What we got here, but anyway. Uh, they may not have a sense of this, but Butler, when they went to two national championship games, they had a first round pick. They had a lottery pick in Gordon Hayward. And then when Gordon Hayward left, they still, they still went to the national championship game and had a second round pick named Shelvin Mack. And intertwined was a kid named Matt Howard, who everybody in the state of Indiana thought was one of, if not the best player in the state of Indiana. So what you're seeing is the little engine that could, right, with some big old motors on it. That's what Butler was, and that's what I see out of this TCU team led by Max Duggan. Max Duggan, are you kidding me? That dude looks like he could play anywhere in the country. I don't know if he's a prospect. I don't know that he's not a prospect. But what I do know is this. When I watch him play, I see a guy that is talented enough, throws it well enough, runs it well enough, leads it better than any, and at the end of the day, you know what he does? He inspires everybody else on his football team. Now, I got to tell you, when I look at that, I go, well, that's pretty good. That's what you should do. Is it not? Like, if you're the quarterback, you got to go, hey, man, look, here's the thing. This is what we're going to run. This is how we're going to run it. Is what you're going to do, you're going to do, and you're going to do. Let's go. And you don't explain yourself. You just do it. That's just what quarterbacks do. They're just like, all right, this is what we're going to do. And that's what I see out of this kid. And I got to tell you something else. This kid's no joke. This kid don't mess around. This kid will try to win it for you. And I think Sonny Dykes, it didn't come back to haunt them relative to getting into the playoffs, but it came back to haunt them relative to winning their conference title, not getting him to football is idiotic uh, on the two-yard line. I don't know if you saw it, but not getting him to football was about as dumb a thing as you could possibly do. Uh, the YouTube chat, we're out here pumping it up pretty good. Bill Martin, BSDR, David Helton, Joe from Lapel, Joe to the Sea, John Dasman, El Presidente, and Outkick. We got a couple hundred. Get on. Let's go. Let's have a day. But anyway, that's how I look at it. College basketball tonight, my Hoosiers go, so I got my shirt on. I think we play Kennesaw State. It's only a 19-point favorite. The problem you have with Indiana, a lot of you are asking me how would I bet it. The problem you have with Indiana is you don't know who's playing. Like every other day, someone's in a boot. Somebody asked me, Dan, why aren't there college basketball games this week? Well, this is the one week of the year where you try to play early in the week and you give the kids a few days off for Christmas. Remember, college basketball is a both semester sport. Like it goes, and I'm taking all the preseason stuff out. I'm talking about when practice starts. You basically start practice in mid September, and your first game early November, and your last game, if you play well, can be in April. It, it, even if you play well and don't make the NCAA tournament, there's all these other tournaments. So you got eligibility. Kids never get to go home. So this is the time of year where kids get to go home and coaches get to take a little bit of a break. They just do. They get to take a little bit of a break. So there's not much college uh, hoops. on. That's why the pros take over on Christmas Day, not college. That's just the way it is. But there used to be a Hawaii tournament where you're like, all right, here we go. I want to go back to something um, yesterday. Yesterday, we were talking and we got cut off and we were talking about Nebraska football and we were talking about Mickey Joseph. Now, Mickey Joseph um, was he stood to be. I want you to think about this. You have reached the, the maximum time permitted for recording your message. If you are satisfied with your in message, the country, press as one. to assist, listen to I your message, press two to erase to and re-record. Press three. I think I did. I think it's like a 10 minute message here while I was doing the show. He heard all are this. Are you still so there? You yes, the maximum I'm still time there. permitted for recording your message. If you are satisfied but with anyway, your message, so this one. guy.
Yeah, I think because uh, things, you know, transitioned from that regime side to that fundamentalist side. So um, we also had to change some of our tactics and our procedures and everything else and how we did things to cope with these guys, because they were coming up with some ingenious ways of doing things along the line as well with some of the IEDs, some of the, you know, the booby trap in the, the houses, things like that, using the cell phones to call to detonate everything. Um, so it became, I think, as much as you say, more violent in that way, because with the regime guys too, we knew that there was a, the end state was trying to get Saddam so that we needed Intel as well. We needed to gather that intelligence. There was only so much that was there uh, from previous, uh, you know, just historical data. Then we had them actually making it, make it real Intel and workable Intel. Um, but with the fundamentalists, you know, they, if you gave them a chance to vote and we'd say vote based off, okay, does this guy want to just, is he going to go along with the capture or is he wanting to fight? And then let's, let's see who wins. You know, um, they would rather fight than do anything. There was, you know, so many times guys would detonate suicide, suicide vests because it's like, well, they're not going to take me, clack themselves off thinking they're killing, you know, other folks around them. Um, but, you know, they just, I don't know, they just were different folks. And it was like, we had to get more violent in a way, you know, because again, we were going after Intel and doing things and, and our procedures and t everything on the battlefield just had to kind of adjust just like they were doing. That's crazy. I, I truly cannot imagine. And I, you know, I was in college. Um, I started college in what, 2010. So I was in high school when things were getting kind of real bad in the 06, 07 era. And I remember people would always talk about like, you know, do we really need to be fighting these guys? Do, are they really that bad? I'm like, you know, this Zarqawi guy is literally chopping people's heads off, right? And don't think it stops there. Like, if this guy could, he'd chop all of our heads off, too. Fortunately, they dropped a couple bombs on him, I believe, if I recall correctly. So now I want to get into some comparing and contrasting. What Oh, baby, the great Rocky Blyer. you got to understand something, people. Rocky Blyer and Franco Harris were the preeminent running backs in the NFL. You had Mercury Morris, Jim Kick, Larry Zonka, and Walter Payton came in a little bit later. But Rocky Blyer and Franco Harris. Rocky Blyer won a, won a bronze star, purple heart, and then came out of Vietnam and was a great NFL player. You lost your friend, Franco Harris, and I'm very, very sorry about that, Rocky. Your thoughts on the passing of Franco Harris? Well, it, you know, obviously, obviously it's been a shock to all of us. Uh, obviously, um, we, uh, we miss him. But it, it's really, you know, it's an unfortunate situation with everything that was taking place. Uh, you know, Franco was on a... Uh, on on uh, on the pedestal. I mean, here was a weekend of uh, festivities in Franco's honor. Macklin reception, a hundredth, uh, uh, or the, the best play in a hundred years in the National Football League, a uh, fiftieth anniversary of that immaculate reception. Things that turned around, uh, and just to have him pass um, in the evening, uh, it was like uh, a shock to all of us. I had talked to him that day. Earlier in the morning, we were talking about all the festivities and some that I was going to be able to make and not make. And I just wanted to apologize him beforehand, you know, and he was, uh, <laughs> we were laughing and, uh, and, and talking about it. He said, don't worry, but again, it's all about a team effort. He said, it's all about a team effort. He said, your health is more important than anything else. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see you whenever we can and blah, blah, blah. We would have went on uh, thereafter. Uh, and then to be able to get that call early in the morning, right after midnight uh, by his son to say that Franco had passed and it was unreal. I mean, was, what, do you, what do you mean he passed? Uh, and what cost it or whatever it was? Those questions, um, we don't know as of yet. And, uh, and so nothing has been released. But, you know, in his eulogy, um, as we will reflect back on the impact that he had um, on all of us at different periods of time, because, you know, now, now we get a chance to be able to do that. Um, and I've talked about to him, you know, the impact that he had on on me and just uh, the way he approached the game. 
um, and that uh, Franco that the, 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 that Franco was a part of a team, you know, and 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 the things that he did, just <laughs> the things that he did, and and what we were taught, uh, it was just becomes natural to him. Now, one of the things, and I just say this, is I can remember. He came in rookie year, so rookie year he's uh, he's our number one pick out of Penn State. I don't know much about Franco at the time. I'm just kind of trying to make the team myself, and um, and so he comes in. He's he's late two weeks uh, uh, before the All Star game that we had at that time, and uh, uh, and so uh, he you know so he comes now into camp, and we all take a look at him, and, and so everything that I was ever taught was hey, hey if you're going to run the ball, coach. Gonna run the ball. You you run the ball. You hit the hole. You hit the two hole. You hit the four hole. You hit the three hole, five hole. You know, and, and don't get anybody any options. And hit it quickly. And so, so Franco now comes in and he comes up to the line and he kind of dances around a little bit and then, and he runs over here. You know, so I'm thinking of that in my mind. Oh, this kid's not gonna make it. You know, because it's not gonna uh, work out that way. And so I uh, later on I got a chance to talk to him. I said, uh, it's, you, okay, what, what what's your Unique here. He said, well, he said, you know, they do call a two hole or they call a four hole. But by the time you get to the line, sometimes it's not the two hole or the four hole. And you have to be able to defy, dis, decipher where, where that hole is. He said, so that's what I, I come up and dance around. And that's been kind of his, you know, his his approach to the game throughout those years that he had been, had played. Um, and um, and the other in, in the other interesting thing is that people may not know or so on. So he comes in as a herald and he started the first uh, game of that season. Then he got benched and oh. he's on the bench for like four games. He said, but it was an adjustment for me that I had not anticipated, you know, different than coming out of high school into college. He said, but coming out of college into the pros, he said, was just uh, a little more than I had imagined that uh, that had taken place. So it took a time for me to be able to adjust. Uh, and he comes back uh, and he uh, <laughs> the remaining nine games. And he gains a thousand yards, rookie of the season. <laughs> we go to the playoffs for the first time in 40 years. And and he comes out with the play of the NFL over 100 years, the immaculate reception goes on so it's um and i would like to i suppose as we talk about franco in that regard just you know the impact that he had on his teammates on the team staying in the community um giving back into the community and uh, uh and he's been very passionate about what he does um and so on so uh, uh we're gonna miss him dearly yeah. when you when you guys were rolling and you guys were, you know, you're winning four Super Bowls and, you know, the publicity and, and all the kind of kind of stuff. And, and everybody was a big name, you know, mean Joe Green, L.C. Green. You, you, you still remember all you guys, Bradshaw, yeah. Swans making plays. Where did Franco fit inside the team? What was his leadership role or where, where was he at in all that? Well, you know, he, so Franco was, and the Franco was, Franco was a very quiet guy. I mean, Franco didn't say a whole lot. I mean, he wasn't a grandstander. He wasn't one of those team leaders that were, you know, leading the charge of any nature or another. Um, Franco had a, a, a very small demeanor to the point where, you know, it, it, I, I, I put this in perspective. As I said, number one pick, um, and uh, uh, the. Uh, was the all star in the, the in the in the in the uh, uh, the game uh, in the all star game I should say uh, prior to the season so he was and and because of that he got a car anyway so he tells a story which is kind of interesting he said you know he said I come here to Pittsburgh and the first question that the kids around the neighborhood ask me he said well what kind of car do you drive. And then he goes, what? He said, well, what kind of car? What are, you, what are you driving, a Cadillac or, you know, you're driving a Lincoln or whatever it is? And in his mind, he said, all of a sudden for me, he said, the association of the plane uh, into these kids was what kind of car? So Franco didn't have a car. He took the bus to practice. He would, he would take the bus to practice and then, and then rely on some of us who lived in his area to take him home after practice. Um, and who, who had a car? And he, so, uh, so it, 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 
just got to kind of put that in perspective as, you know, here is a kind of a, the number one cool guy. And you'd be trying. And I, 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 you know, I told them, I said, what kind of car do you drive? A, a Cadillac? <laughs> no, maybe a Porsche. Yes. <laughs> 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 Franco was very, I, it was just, it was just kind of like down to earth and in, 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 in that regard uh, about how he approached life and the impact that he had on, 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 on different people. Rocky, last thing before I let you go, um, you you said that you had just talked to Franco Harris, and and I, I read stuff where he was just doing an interviews with people. Uh, uh, Chris Russo had him on his radio show, and I mean, it, it, do you have any idea what happened here? Nothing, uh, nothing. Not you know, there's nothing. There's nothing that came out. And 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 the and the point is this: is that sometimes you go, okay, fine, a guy's been ill, he's been a pet. Right. Heart probably issues in the past, or is a high blood pressure, whatever it might be, but nothing, nothing. I mean, Franco was Franco was a healthy guy. Uh, two people, I mean, Franco was so conscientious about the COVID um, uh, aspect of, over the last several years that even to, I mean, up to this day, he would come to meetings with a mask, you know, when everybody else was not walking around with anybody else. But he was just, he was just, so he took care of himself, and and so when we found that out, we just go. Wow, what happened? And so I don't know, and I don't know what the official statement will be um, if they find out what the cause was and uh, and the reasons why. I don't know whether we'll ever know, but um, it wasn't as if he had a lingering illness that uh, that uh, took his life. Rocky, I can't thank you enough, man. Thank you for the Thanks. time. Much, much appreciated. And Thanks. Um, let me last. Are they going to have? Sure. I mean, is, is, is today's the day today's the 50th anniversary is are things going to still go on this weekend for all you guys well, uh, i the only thing that is going on as i understand is that the structure was there was a, a meeting there was going to be a gathering last night that had been canceled um there at 3 uh, 30 this afternoon there was going to be a gathering over at the monument of the immaculate reception um, uh, in the parking lot uh, over this it, 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 uh, at the stadium, um, that has been canceled. This evening there was going to be a, re, uh, a, a party. Franco was going to have a party at the Heinz uh, History uh, Center, um, and so that's kind of that's. <laughs> Dana, his lovely wife, had said, you know, one thing that Franco loved was giving his parties. He loved his parties. And so maybe in um, his memory, we'll have that uh, party. Tonight. Yeah. Appreciate you, Rocky. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thanks for your time, guys. My pleasure. Merry Christmas. That's, Merry Christmas to you as well. That's the great Rocky Blyer, gold star. I mean, honest to God, Purple Heart as Vietnam, 19... 68, 19 to 1970, and he came and won four Super Bowls. I mean, that is a life, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, the passing of Franco Harris, I think, uh, touched a lot of people. And again, as I said, man, all of a sudden, I'm I'm paying attention to, you know, the timeline going backwards, and he's on with Chris Russo. And as, as Rocky said, he sounded great. He kept and, and I, I, you know, it's one of those deals where we, it's cliche. I understand it's cliche. But man, oh man, you you have got to take care of those that you love and you got to do it every freaking day because quite frankly, uh, you don't know when it might be gone. But you also, you know what? You also got to stand up. And uh, my next guest stands up. Uh, Jake Paquette is joining us. He is running. We're going to get into what he's running. He's, he's, he's going to be a congressman. He needs to be a congressman. We got to get him into Congress. And that's great. But before we get into all that, this is a man that was a Ranger. This is a man that was a Patriot. Yes, a New England Patriot. He won Super Bowl. So I got to ask you, you have been around Belichick. You saw what happened with Jacoby Myers and the pass backwards. If you were in that facility on Monday, what's going on with Belichick after that kind of deal, Jake? Well, I'd be scared for my life uh, if I was involved with that play at all. Um, you know, that was the, the the first reaction that I had when I saw that play was that was the most un Belichickian, unpatriot play that I've ever seen. You know, one thing that Bill used to do 
uh, in the off season and even throughout the actual season, um, every Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday early in the week, he would show kind of a low light tape of plays throughout the week or from the previous season, um, you know, of what teams had done that were just stupid boneheaded plays, you know, things that, you know, as he would say, you know, we don't play like this, you know, this is bad football. And I mean, this was like the ultimate low light play of the season, um, probably a, a Belichick's entire coaching career. Uh, hard to believe that happened, but you know, I'd be I'd be scared for my life if I was a Patriot player this week. And I mean, there's a big difference between you saying you're scared for your life. Hell, you're an Army Ranger, or a normal person being scared for their life. So that really sums up the impact uh, of Belichick. You know, uh, let me let me go this route with you. I had the opportunity a hundred years ago. I played coach. Uh, with Bob Knight and Belichick and Parcells used to come visit. And I was a young coach. Belichick was a young coach. And we're just sitting there. Um, when you went and you got drafted, you went, played for him. Um, was there an aura about him? Was, was, was there a feeling of expectation that even though it maybe didn't have to be said, you just knew by walking into the building? Absolutely. And, you know, along with a couple of those names you mentioned, um, you know, Bobby Knight and Bill Parcells, you know, I think Coach Belichick has always been, you know, legendary for his ability to, you know, get people, um, you know, to come from different backgrounds with different personal goals to be able to sacrifice, um, you know, and become part of a team and, and, and just, you know, have everyone marching to the beat of the same drum, um, you know, and, and be willing to, uh, to work hard and, and and do things that not every other team around the league is willing to do uh, and, and work. We had veterans come in. You know, I, I loved it. I used to love to see other veterans come in uh, every off season and, and particularly during training camp and every single one of them, you know, guys who had been around for 10, 11 years, you know, even like, you know, hall of fame caliber players, um, you know, who would just like be asking guys in the locker room, like, is this, is this for real? Like, do we, do we, do we, do we practice this hard every single day? I mean, do we do we watch this much? Like, like, they couldn't believe it because Belichick was able to cultivate a team culture. Um, and you know, obviously Tom Brady and a lot of the team leaders had a lot to do with that as well. Um, but he was able to cultivate this team culture where, um, you know, guys were just able to, to put those blinders on um, and do things that other teams around the league were not able to do. And I think that's, you know, that's part of the reason why they were able to, to, to have that dynasty and, and win so many Super Bowls. And I was just so blessed to, to be a small part of that for four years. Jake, when you got done playing, um, you went into the army. You became a ranger. You became a hero. What, what, what was your thought process, and what, what made you go join the army after an NFL career? Well, first of all, my my service was nothing compared to true heroes like Rocky Blyer. I mean, I, I I'm so glad that I got to see the end of that segment. Um, you know, he is a, a great American. Purple Heart was wounded in Vietnam. Um, but, you know, I always wanted to serve, um, you know, I don't come from a military family or anything, but, um, you know, we, we had some people there with the Patriots organization, um, an ex Navy SEAL and, uh, you know, Belichick always had, um, you know, military veterans, you know, former admirals and generals come and speak to the team. And, you know, I was truly inspired by that. And, you know, I, I wanted military service to be a part of my story and I wanted to play ball for as long as I could. But, um, you know, when that playing time came to an end, um, I decided to join the army and go through ranger school and deploy to Iraq and, um, you know, be in the infantry and, you know, be a part of an amazing unit, like the 101st airborne division. Um, and that was truly the, you know, that, that was the honor of my life. And, you know, I was very blessed to be able to play college football at the university of Arkansas, be a part of some great teams. I was a small part of a great super bowl championship team in new England, but, you know, truly it was, it was the best thing to be a part of, you know, the ultimate team, um, you know, which is a, an infantry unit, um, you know, be a part of that Ranger legacy um, and be able to serve my country. You, you, you ran, uh, you ran for Congress. And when you look at, well, let me go this route with you, because when you look at our elections, and I think this is a very dangerous part of our uh, uh, time in our country, because I don't think people trust elections. I don't think people feel that elections are fair. And if they don't feel that way, whether they're right or not, I mean, look, read what you want. But boy, does that tear down the fabric of our society if we don't trust our own elections? That's like Middle East kind of stuff. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad you made that point, because I think too often, 
Um, you know, people vilify others for questioning the integrity of elections. But well, wait a minute, like that's you know that that's the problem in and of itself. It is you know if we had these these never ending election seasons, it's like the twelve days of Christmas where we can't count ballots. Um, you know, we have all these recounts. You know, the these these midnight vote drops. Um, you know, it's 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 really embarrassing and it's shameful. And you're exactly right. You can't have a small R Republican form of government if people don't trust the integrity of our elections. And you know, it baffles me and it makes no sense that countries like France and Canada and other major Western nations, you know, can have elections that are conducted 100% on paper ballots, and you have verified results um, that are observed and, and trusted within. You know, a matter of hours. And in the United States, we can't do that. So, you know, if you want to talk about undermining elections, I think it's the people who are trying to prop up the status quo and are not listening to people who don't trust what's happening. Yeah. I, look, I think it's incredibly dangerous. I'll tell you something else that I think is incredibly dangerous. Um, I, I, political correctness, wokeness, whatever you want to call it, you lived it. All of a sudden, we're talking about Marines not saying sir or ma'am. I mean, I look at all this kind of stuff and I say, where does all this end? Where, what, what, are we still strong? Do you feel there's still a, a strength in our military? I think we're in the midst of a, a, a great reckoning um, in, in our military. I think it's, it was one of the last institutions that you know, the hard left had yet to really conquer. And um, you know, I, I think they're in the, in the process of taking it over, sadly. Um, and, you know, really what the, the inflection point that I'm seeing, we've all seen these articles and these statistics coming out about how the military, the main branches are drastically missing their recruiting benchmarks. And I say we're in the midst of this reckoning because, you know, I, I think all of us kind of understand instinctively that a disproportionately high number of people who serve in combat arms in these frontline, you know, infantry and special ops type units, you know, these are people from heartland America. You know, these are you know, people who come from places like where I'm from, Arkansas, um, you know, people who have been vilified by this current administration, you know, called MAGA Americans. You know, those are the people who are putting their lives on the line to a disproportionately high percentage in these military units. And so if that group, if they let go of the rope, if they say, hey, you know, military service is not for me, I don't want to be a part of this woke nonsense, then who's going to be left to defend our country? Who's going to be left to, you know, put themselves on the line um, you know, to 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 preserve our our position as a, the global hegemon, the superpower. So, I think that reckoning. You're, you're right; it's incredibly dangerous. And you know, we're in the middle of this sea change, and you know, the the future looks bleak unless we're able to turn this around. Um, but it, it's not looking great right now. No, how, how do you turn it around in your mind? Yeah, you know, the military. We don't have a funding problem. You, know, you hear people talk about you know eight hundred billion dollars of appropriations. We have a leadership problem. You know, it starts with the commander in chief. You know, obviously, I, I'm a Republican. I'm a very, very conservative person. Um, you know, that I, I ran for Congress on that kind of a message. We've got to have the right leaders in place. You know, it's I'm a student of history. Uh, you know, and I'm sure you know Rocky Blyer would agree that the the type of man who once led our military, you know, that person doesn't doesn't have a chance to reach that kind of that upper echelon of leadership in the current system. I mean, could you even imagine someone like a Douglas MacArthur leading our military <laughs> now? Or a George Patton, um, you know, like that, that's it's, it's unthinkable. You know, those types of personalities either get snuffed out at the captain or major, kind of the middle ranks level, or that person doesn't even get into the military into the first place. So, you know, we've got to we, we've got to like put the kind of leaders in place who are willing to cultivate that kind of greatness um, that can rise, you know, like preserve and protect and promote those types of personalities. Because everything, like whether it's in sports with Belichick or you know the military, it's no different. It starts at the top. If you don't have the right leaders in place, then your organization has almost zero chance to succeed. So you know, I, I think it's all about leadership. It's not about funding. It's not about appropriations. It's not about how many ships we have in our navy. You hear a lot of wonky people talk about that. You know, that to me, that's really missing the entire point. We've got a leadership problem, not a funding problem. Man, you know, it's 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 interesting. I just started a book uh, called Five Presidents, and it's about a, a Secret Service agent's, basically his life story, his time with five presidents. And again, I just started it. I'm probably 30, 40 pages in, whatever. And it's fascinating. He's talking about, you know, Dwight Eisenhower, who was, you know, a, 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 the commander of everything. He was, he was the guy. And the respect that 
Eisenhower's position into becoming the president afforded not only him, but all across the world when he traveled. They talk about traveling somewhere and 20, 30, 50,000 people come out for a parade for the president of the United States. And the point was kind of, yes, it's for the president of the United States, but Eisenhower was also the supreme commander and a very respected commander. And I'm, yeah, I'm I mean, reading this going, our current president doesn't know which way to get off a damn stage. And he's sniffing little kids like, what are we doing here? Yeah, I mean, contrast, you know, that scene that Eisenhower described, um, you know, with the, you know, the welcome that Joe Biden got in Saudi Arabia, you know, especially compared to the welcome that, you know, Chairman Xi received, you know, the, the Chinese premier received. Uh, in Saudi Arabia. I mean, they, the, the sound is essentially like they sent Joe Biden an Uber. And, you know, when he showed up at the palace, they just kind of gave him a fist bump and said, you know, hey, you know, uh, you know, glad you could make it. And then when the Chinese you know, dictator arrived, you know, they had military parades. They, they brought out the full welcome wagon. It, it was kind of more of that reception that Dwight Eisenhower described. And I, I think that really, um, you know, without saying it out loud, it really kind of, uh, uh, you know, shows everyone who has eyes to see and ears to hear, um, you know, the, the true ascendant power globally and, and really kind of where, um, you know, our enemies and even our allies see uh, the position of America falling to. So um, you're exactly right. It's all about leadership. We've got to have people who, um, you know, who understand, you know, what the dignity of that office means uh, and the kind of power and prestige that we have to project internationally. Um, you know, previous presidents, you know, uh, obviously, uh, you know, a president like Eisenhower, who was the, as you mentioned, the Supreme Allied Commander, he understood that power and prestige. Um, but obviously, the current commander in chief he either doesn't understand it or he's just not, you know, cognizant enough uh, to project that kind of power globally. I, I think you have to, not you, but we have to think like lunatics to not be considered a bigot, to not be considered a racist, misogynist, uh, whatever it is. It's almost like your thinking has to turn to that of utter stupidity to, and common sense out the window, or else you're going to be bigoted. Like the, the, the simple idea, I, I talked about this story the other day of some guy that's a rapist saying, well, I feel like a woman sometimes, so they moved him to a woman's prison is just like, and if you go against it, you're, when did this start? Like, when did these words, like, you can't call yourself an American at Stanford. You can't say the word, hey, you guys, come here. It's got to be folks. When did words become the most important thing? What are we doing here? Well, if, if you study history and you study, um, you know, how the, the march of communism works when it infiltrates a society, you know, this thing has happened in the past. And, you know, for me, um, you know, what I've seen throughout the, this nonsense, you know, the, the, the greatest, the most powerful currency in politics is loyalty. And if you think about it, it really, you know, saying the truth, saying the sky is blue, you know, really doesn't prove your loyalty to anyone. But nonsense, looking at the sky and saying the sky is green, you know, that shows that you are someone who can be loyal because you're willing to say utter nonsense with a straight face in public. So right now we're in this death spiral of these displays of loyalty. And it gets more and more absurd because in order to prove loyalty, you know, to the to the powers that be to the hard left, you have to say more you know, more absurd things in public with a straight face to prove your loyalty. So, you know, I, I had these conversations all the time. People are just like, you know, did you see the latest insane thing? But to me that that makes sense in the context of these are just simply displays of loyalty. And we're, we're in this death spiral now. And, you know, I, I don't really think it stops um, because, you know, the, the displays of loyalty are just going to get more and more absurd. You have a great tweet out at, at Jake, B-E-Q-U-E-T-T-E-91. And it, this is the tweet. When your rulers know that you'll allow yourselves to be injected with experimental drugs You'll let them shut down your church and your business, and you'll gladly hand over half your income every single year. Should be, should we be surprised when they pass corrupt bills that they don't read? Man, that 
that's common sense that isn't common. And just like that hit me when I read it this morning, like, what are we doing? <laughs> you know? Well, you're, you're exactly right. And, you know, it's it shouldn't it shouldn't surprise people. Um, you know, you see a lot of people on the right who are in the left who are very upset um, about this one point seven trillion dollar omnibus bill. It's four thousand pages long that no one's read. But you know, as I pointed out in that tweet, you know, after the experience of the past couple of years, when our government did these awful, evil, tyrannical things to us, and they really suffered no consequences. I mean, this was the first election cycle since the beginning of the direct election of U.S. senators in 1917 that every single Senate incumbent won re-election. So, you know, there's there's no consequences. You know, they're in no political danger. They're in no physical danger. I don't see any angry mobs forming outside the U.S. Capitol. Um, so, you know, the, the real question isn't, you know, you know wh- why are they doing this? I think the real question is, why wouldn't they do this? Yeah, it, 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 look, it's like anything else. If you, there are no consequences to evil and stupid, evil and stupid will keep being evil and stupid. You're exactly right. And that's, you know, I, I ran, you know, I, I tried to primary challenge a, a sitting incumbent U.S. senator. I was unsuccessful. And I, a lot of these representatives, you know, in Congress and in the Senate, you know, they, the, the, the system has been able to fortify um, you know, their positions in power. And, you know, look at Mitch McConnell. I, I always use this, this example of Mitch McConnell. You know, he has, he's the most universally despised figure in all of American politics. He has like a 7% approval rating. I mean, his approval rating is, is lower than like syphilis, but he's the most powerful Republican in government right now. He is totally, you know, he, he is invincible. He is bulletproof. I mean, he he won his uh, leadership election like 37 to 10. Only 10 Republican U.S. senators had the courage to vote against him. Um, he's not going to lose an election in Kentucky. So, you know, it's we're in this broken system where people are completely and totally invincible and completely immune from the consequences of their actions. So, you know, we, we we're, we're going to have to, you know, have some really tough conversations about where we go from here because, you know, the, the analogy I use, and just to close using a sports metaphor, you know, imagine a college football coach who every two years, you know, he 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 lost 10 games a season. Um, you know, there were there were 5,000 people in the stands, but every two years he gets a raise and a contract extension. You know, that's what's happening with members of Congress, um, but they can't replace the head coach. So, you know, like it's that system where when there's no accountability, there's no consequences. It's just not healthy. How is your your Army Ranger? You do a lot for veterans. You know, your Arkansas project's fantastic. How are veterans feeling? I'll tell you why I asked. A friend of mine called me yesterday. He's 81 years old, and he knows I do this show. And he's like, Dan, I, I got to tell you, I'm so glad you're doing this show. Uh, I did not serve the military for the crap that's going on in our country right now. And he brought that up to me unsolicited. I, he's a doctor. I know him as my doctor. I didn't really know he even served. But when he said that and I was having you on, I thought to myself, man, I, I got to believe that the vast majority of our military feels the same way that my doctor friend did. What, what, what is the morale of vets? Well, I, I'll tell you right now, um, you know, I, I did a, a year long statewide campaign for U.S. Senate, and I've heard so many, so many stories just like that. You know, people who are, are reaching the their twilight years, the end of their lives, you know, those who served and even, you know, some who didn't. And they're looking at our culture and our political landscape and our country, and they're just heartbroken. And, you know, that's, that's part of the reason I ran for office. Um, you know, because, you know, it's going to be incumbent on my generation, you know, I'm 33 years old. Um, you know, it's going to be incumbent upon us to fix this because either we're going to fix this or it's not going to get fixed. And, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't want to be dramatic, but I'd rather, I'd rather die. I'd rather be dead than at 81 years old for me to look back on, on my life and look back on this country and say, you know, this is not what I you know, served and raised my right hand and wore the flag of my uniform to protect and defend. And something's got to change. You know, it's, it's, I think there's enough people who believe what we believe, who are willing to do something about it, to change it. 
Um, but, you know, obviously we're just, we're not there yet. And, you know, as a country, we're, we're wrestling with this. I think, you know, obviously people want change, but the system is just not really set up to, uh, to promote that kind of change. Um, and, you know, it's just, I, I wish I had a more hopeful, positive message, especially around Christmas. But the, the, the truth is this, I mean, I, I, I respect your audience enough to speak the truth. It's going to get worse before it gets better because, you know, the people of America, we just, you know, we, we, we have to kind of bottom out um, before things, you know, really, um, really get better, in my opinion. I agree. I, and at the bottom is getting closer. That's, I mean, I, it, I, it's amazing. Jake, are uh, you going to run again? You know, we'll see. It, it has to be the right opportunity. Um, you know, I, I truly believe that you know, incumbents are, are, are essentially invincible, especially in primaries. Um, you know, it, it's such a low turnout um, electorate. Um, it's, it's really sad. It's kind of the state of our politics. You know, only about 20 to 25 percent of registered voters actually vote in primaries. So, you know, taking people out in primaries is going to be very difficult. Um, if there's an open seat in Arkansas, you know, maybe I'll, I'll take a look at that. Um, you know, I, I truly believe that, um, you know, my calling is to serve our country. I did that in uniform. I, I, I attempted to do it um, via politics and I'd love to serve again, um, but it, it'll have to be the right opportunity. Um, and, you know, that's going to be an open seat, but we'll, you know, we'll see how that, that goes. I mean, these, these, these members of Congress, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't just retire. Uh, you know, like they, they stay up there 20, 30, 40 years. Um, it's a pretty good gig for them, especially if you're, um, you know, someone who wants to just kind of support the, the current system. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Jake, I appreciate you. I hope you'll come back. That was wonderful, man. That was great talk. Now, thanks for having me. This is great. Really love the show. Thank you. That, that was uh, absolutely outstanding. And do, do yourself a favor. Uh, look, I, I, it, it, it is hard because you you don't want to be negative at Christmas. Uh, but it, look, let's be honest. Go to I'm gonna give you the website J A K E B E Q U E T T E dot com and learn more. And, and, and because look, I, here's what I always say: the reason I left ESPN was because what what am I gonna do? I'm gonna be 80 years old. I'm gonna be talking about guys putting a ball through a hoop. That's crap, right? I want to be involved. I'll interviews with Jake or interviews with Rocky Blyer, I think shed a light on what's real in our country as opposed to the crap. So go visit Jake's site, learn more about support, and let's continue the ball rolling. It's, it's again, uh, it's fun calling basketball games. Hey, he made a basket. Yay, Rock, go fight, win. All right, but it's more important that people that have views opposite of what's going on right now discuss those views. We'll talk to our friend, uh, the gun show coming up, but Jake, thank you so much. We will be right back. Thank you, sir. Hey Jake, thank College football's in trouble. There's a lot of people trying to keep it from happening. I think it's a general consensus across the college football landscape. We want to play football. College football is a huge part of the fall. It's a huge part of Americana itself. It just really felt like people in the country needed college football to just feel a little sense of normal. Big news from the Big Ten as the conference releasing its 10-game football schedule. We go home thinking there's going to be practice the next day. Everybody gets a text, stay home, everything's canceled. Big Ten fall football season has been canceled. We just believe collectively there's too much uncertainty. I guess what I'm trying to understand, though, Kevin, is that was the same position you had six days ago. The Big Ten is an unmitigated disaster. There was a ton of confusion. There was presidents saying one thing, there was coaches saying another. Players had to be silent, coaches had to be silent, ADs had to be silent. People said, how does what you just did make any sense? And nobody really knew what the heck happened when they voted to cancel the season. You make this huge historical announcement and then Kevin Warren never does a press conference to explain it. It was like a masterclass on how not to handle a crisis. The word really that was lacking in all this is transparency. It felt like a lot of stuff was happening behind closed doors. Even today, we still don't know what occurred. So you don't tell us parents, that's fine, but you're not telling the young men that it affects. We have to make a decision to save the season. What about the history books? What about the rivalry games? What about Paul Bunyan's ax? How is that not gonna go to a team this year? This is a failure of epic magnitude. The Big Ten presidents and leaders should be held accountable for the disastrous decisions that they're making.
Then the commissioner doubles down, saying his decision will not be revisited. And that's the point it felt like a war was declared on the Big Ten and Kevin Warren. Everything turned Because if this is medical, then you would have stopped the game of football a long time ago. I think the Big Ten leaders will tell you that they probably made a mistake in hindsight. If I had the chance to do it all over last year, um, I would I would do uh, make the same decisions that we made. Hey, I don't know if uh, you saw this, but America's oldest football quarterback, kid who actually started out in Arkansas, then he went to North Texas, Austin Ane of North Texas, has declared for the NFL draft at 29 years old going back. My man was a second round pick in 2012 of the New York Yankees. He played six seasons. Guess what? All right. It didn't work out great. So what does he do? He goes and plays football. And I'll tell you what, pretty good player. Uh, starting quarterback. Next thing you know, though, at 29 years old, married with a kid. Hey, look, a lot of people are married uh, with kids in college. Hell, but I got to tell you, the guy, uh, good for him. No, nah, good for him. I mean, let's be honest. If you're 29 years old and you're hanging out and you just got done playing a little bit uh, of baseball and it didn't quite go the way you wanted to go, why wouldn't you? Seriously, why wouldn't you say, you know what, I'm going to go play college football? And then he just announced that he is going to go to the NFL draft. Now, I personally, a 29-year-old quarterback, I don't know that we need it. I don't know that we don't need it, but you're going to get somebody that is experienced. You're going to get somebody that, quite frankly, uh, can go get it done and teach the younger children what to do. That's right. Um, today is the 50th anniversary of the Immaculate Reception, and we had Rocky Blyer on. But did you also know that in the iconic, Ladies and gentlemen, yes, the iconic comedy series Seinfeld, it is Festivus. That's right, a Festivus for the rest of us. And as we all know, and I would love some input on freaking uh, our YouTube chat, it is the airing of grievances. Yes, there are feats of strength, and George and his father must wrestle, but Feats of strength aren't the thing on this show. I could have gotten a dumbbell and done some lifting, but no, we prefer the airing of grievances. And I will give you my first grievance. Even I, we will also have mean tweets, ladies and gentlemen. One of my first grievances is this, and this is just me. I can't look at people anymore that are wearing masks. I'm sorry. I can't do it. You're wearing a mask. You're walking around. I, I, I got to tell you, I, I can't do it. I'm sure you all can. I'm sure it doesn't bother you. When masks first came out, I did what we were all supposed to do. I put a mask on. But when I looked at you in a mask, it like suffocated me. Then masks went away. I'm watching a college basketball game the other day. I'm not going to say the team because it's a team that I like, and it's actually a guy that I like. The huddle. 
the team. Everybody's right here. Everybody's talking. The coach is right here. He's got everybody around him. And I look, and there's a dude who's outside the huddle with a mask on. Now, don't get me wrong. I know I don't have the context. I know I don't know what it is. But are you like me? Are you just like me? And you see someone now with a mask, and you're like, that person's an idiot. That's all I got. That person is a stone idiot. I, 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 I don't know. Connie says, I can't do it either, Dan. Still wearing a mask after three years screams weakness. I, I, I'm sorry. It drives me nuts. It drives me nuts. I'm going to air this grievance. I've aired this grievance a thousand times, and I'm going to continue airing this grievance. Here it is. In the great state of Indiana, we legitimately have the worst, and I'm going to say this as a definitive statement, we have the worst driver's education teachers. I love teachers. My daughter's a teacher. My mother was a teacher. My father's a teacher. I've taught classes. I'm all in on teachers. My father was a driver's ed teacher. But I got to tell you, I got to tell you, Indiana, we drive in the left lane like it's our job. Indiana, we go 50 in the left lane when the speed limit is 55 to 70. Indiana, every single time I look, there's somebody on a phone. Every time I'm looking, I go around. I give a look as I'm driving. Sometimes I give the hands. What are we doing? Now, back in the day, back in the day, it used to be Michigan drivers. When I would drive on the highway, it was always, or on, uh, we call it the toll road. Some people call it, whatever you call it, we call it the toll road. It basically goes from Chicago to Gary to Detroit or whatever, wherever it goes. But it was always Michigan people. I got a real problem with you people in the state of Indiana. I got a real problem. Y'all are in the left lane. Be dazzled. No, 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 no. Move over. And teachers, see that guy there? See that guy with a pad and paper? See him? Do you see him? Teach right lane etiquette. I got another problem with you, Pete. You ready? We showed it a little bit yesterday. What's going on here with people fighting in fast food restaurants? This all started five years ago, in my opinion, maybe seven, in Syracuse, New York. Lee Ross Dockage, Dan Dockage, Bart Fox, Mike Tirico, Scott Johnson, after a Syracuse game, we're minding our own business. We go down, there's a bar there, it's off campus, and we get a sandwich, and we get a couple beers, and we're going to walk back to the hotel. We're walking back to the hotel in front of the pita pit, which is right next to uh, the cookies thing because we didn't go into cookies but we saw the pita pit a couple guys stopped mike and i and they want to talk basketball and it's great awesome i look inside and a lady is coming across the top with a haymaker to some girl that's behind just making herself a peanut next thing you know here comes a guy a worker out of the back with a broom and he's hitting this lady and there's a damn brawl, and Tariko and I are outside on the sidewalk, and we're looking in, and the two guys that stopped us are looking in, and we're just like, wait a second. Come to find out, this is now a thing. We showed it yesterday. McDonald's bags are flying. People are brawling. What is it about fast food that makes everybody crazy? You go in, you're hungry. I talked about this yesterday. Can we stop fighting in the fast food lines? Let's just eliminate. Like, you don't want to have everything be drive through do you? If I'm McDonald's, I'm like, look, big crazy is throwing hands. 
over the fries. I don't want to be there. I'm closing up shop drive through only. But you know what happens in the drive through I got to tell you, people are throwing things at the drive through people. It is absolutely insane. And as Sinister says, parents at Chuck E. Cheese are throwing down. Why? I'm going to tell you something else. Merry Christmas. That's right. Merry Christmas. If you don't like it, I don't care. It's like a buddy of mine. I always use this analogy, Jennifer. I always say, look, if you don't like it or you're mad at me, go over there and be mad at me. If you don't like me saying Merry Christmas, go over there and don't like me saying Merry Christmas. But you see what has two thumbs wearing red and is going to say Merry Christmas? This guy. This guy. Sometimes I'll say happy holidays, not as any type of give in. It just comes out of my mouth sometimes. But I got to tell you, Merry Christmas, ain't a damn thing wrong with Merry Christmas, you guys. Look, my radio station, Radio One, told us you can't say you guys. It's got to be folks. You can't tell somebody they have nice shoes. Let me tell you something. Jennifer, Lee, Shelly Myers here, Tegan. Laura, my daughter, they got nice shoes. I'm going to tell them they got nice shoes. My little way, my little airing of grievances. John Datsman, Dan, have a great Christmas with your family. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Dan, don't discount concession lines. What? Kuth says, I saw a fight at the concessions at Gainbridge the other night. Two ladies fighting over a $15 grilled cheese, hair pulling was in play. It, certain things drive me nuts. And I got to tell you, that drives me nuts. Will Dan review today's poll results? I just voted yes. I did. All right. Word on the street is you guys got a couple of mean tweets. There's some mean tweets coming at me today because I criticized, unbelievably, I criticized Nick Saban flipping a recruit. Again, I think flipping a recruit shows a lack of integrity. I don't think flipping a recruit should be in play. But you know what? I don't get to make that call. And a lot of people, a lot of people feel the same way. MAGA Dan at it again. You know why I'm MAGA Dan? I'm MAGA Dan, according to this slap, because, well, I actually criticized Nick Saban. Somehow, a criticism of Nick Saban is enough to make me get criticized for being a Make America Great Again person. Now, I want you to think about this just for a second. I want you to think about this just for one second. Make America Great Again. You know who first said that? Ronald Reagan. You know who's the most beloved president of my lifetime? Ronald Reagan. And when you break it down, make America great again. How is that bad? Well, because the hat represents, what does the hat represent? There's a great episode on Curb Your Enthusiasm where Larry David wears a MAGA hat, basically so he doesn't have to hang around people. The show is based in L.A. where you know MAGA is not that popular. I don't have the stones, right? I wish I did. I don't. Maybe I have the stones, but I don't have the, the desire, all right? Maybe I don't have the desire to fight what you got to fight, but wearing a MAGA hat on a plane would seem to be me to be an interesting thing to do. So when you criticize Nick Saban for flipping a recruit, that guy goes to MAGA Dan at it again. Okay, what's next here on the old, uh, <laughs> uh, what does this say? Lots of time for outrage when you're unemployed, I guess. That's a misnomer. Look, the Indie Star put out dockage fired from radio job, and then they corrected it. The Indy Star is filled with idiots. The Indy Star doesn't know what my contract says. The Indy Star doesn't know what my contract demands of both me and them. But they put it out that you're fired. 
Then they correct it. So idiots like, I'm not saying his name because his name, I know what it means. I caught it. Don't get me wrong. But idiots like this will always go, you don't have a job. I'm sitting here doing a job. In fact, I got the best job I've ever had. I love this job. I love our team. I love Dylan and Ryan and Tyler and, and Aaron and Haley and Corey and Chuck and all the guys that helped me. I don't know what to tell you. I got the greatest job ever. But because some morons decide that I'm getting fired, I'm out, I'm this, all right, seems like I got a job. I don't know. Let me go to one more Festivus. Last airing of grievances. The airing of grievance, and I talk about this often, one of my pet peeves in this world is drag shows. I don't get them. I don't understand them. I don't know why we got to put them in front of children. And I'll keep saying it. I'll say it every day. I hope there's a big article in the Indy Star about me being a ist against drag shows. I am a drag show ist. I am against exploiting children. So my festivist wish is that we sober up, smarten up, whatever else up, and we eliminate, we eliminate that drag show. Uh, Denroy three Dockage is so all over the map. His belief in his beliefs, it appears he has no integrity. Okay, I guess I'm pretty solid in my beliefs. No drag shows. Uh, women use the women's bathroom. Men use the men's bathroom. If it's an issue, just put a man and a woman uh, in a sign next to the bathroom. And let whoever wants to use the bathroom use the bathroom. This isn't that complicated. We seem to complicate things. That's another one of my Festivus deals. Dan, we don't have strippers in the classroom. All right, give them to me. You got another one? I like the mean tweets. Oh, boy. Hey, Dan, guess you're supporting the Russians. Why am I not surprised? You are an embarrassment to Indiana. So wait a second. So now I'm supporting the Russians? Now, because I don't want to give my tax dollars to the Ukraine, uh, it Ukrainian government, Dan Carr says, I am supporting the Russians. You are an embarrassment to Indiana. Okay, I'll take it. I will take being an embarrassment to IU. I'll take it. I will. No problem. You got any others? I need one more mean tweet before I go into a holiday greeting. <sighs> oh, man. About time you passed along something about sports instead of worrying about vaccines or a 4,000-page political report that you know nothing about. Clay Jr. took the day off and DD came in. I get called Clay Jr. David Rowe is always a little bit angry with me. David Rowe, I could literally say today, I'm wearing a red shirt and David Rowe would say, well, well, yeah, well, you're Clay Jr. No, I'm not, I'm Dan Dockage. I read enough abbreviated about the 4,000 pages to know that other countries, including the Ukraine, Egypt, and others, are getting a ton of money for border security, and you know who is not us. And I'm going to also do this. I've never really done this, but I pay a lot of money in taxes, and this is the first time that I've never wanted to pay taxes. So I got two words for you, David Rowe. Bite me. That's right. Bite me. All right. Um, the show... You all have made a fantastic and working on Friday of Christmas Eve. Merry Christmas. Thank you. What do you mean working on Friday? It's Friday. You need me right now in Indianapolis. My former show has lost its entire YouTube audience. Somebody just sent me the numbers, which tells me people in Indy 
are driving around aimlessly. They're driving around aimlessly, not knowing where to go or what to do. So I am here helping you. Coop, I appreciate that. I do. And Coop, I appreciate all of everybody's support over the years. Right now, Andy Hughes, Sinister, Ryan Wolf, Outkick, Durflinger, Kirk Nuts, John Dasman, Joda to see. Jennifer Gritty, Denroy Three, Craig Matthews, and Andy Hughes are all on the YouTube chat. We got 300 people watching. We got another 20, 30,000 watching. Our show is growing, but it is only growing because of two reasons. One, the remarkable team that we have led by Aaron and Haley, Dylan, Ryan, and Tyler with the assistance for all of the support from Corey, and Chuck, and Davey, and everybody with the OutKick team, but mostly it's because of you. You choose to come here every day and listen and participate, and I got to tell you, thank you for that. I hope everybody has a merry, merry, merry Christmas. I hope everybody gets to enjoy some time with their family, gets the presents that they want, but more importantly, makes somebody else's day over Christmas. That's what I hope. I don't know. I think we're going to be back here on Monday. There you go. I was a broadcaster in the snow at ESPN during a blizzard. I wasn't cranky like that guy in Iowa. I wasn't crabby like the sports guy that had to go outside. I went outside, ladies and gentlemen. I did. I went outside. I worked like a crazy man. And then I made snow angels. But back to saying thank you. Thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks to those of you that supported our show in Indy, that support our show here, and come on the YouTube chat or on Twitter or you watch it on Facebook or wherever you get it. I am flattered that you would spend time with me every day like you do. And as I said, I hope everybody has the most wonderful, wonderful Christmas. We are off on Monday. Thank you for that, uh, Dylan. But we'll be back on Tuesday. Have a wonderful Christmas, everybody. And again, from the bottom of mine and my family's hearts, thank you for making our show a success.